Hey, internet friends. Pornography has been around for ages, but now it is more mainstream, more accessible, and more brutal than ever. Pushing themes like incest, pedophilia, and sadomasochism, just to name a few. So is mainstream pornography the biggest social experiment ever? Through the dark recesses of the internet is an agenda being pushed. An agenda that involves detachment from reality. Programming users to be spectators and voyeurs, not active participants in their own lives. An agenda that preys upon animalistic desires, reducing people to objects, just call girls and cannon fodder. Today I'm going to break down the history of pornography and discuss who controls this shadowy industry and how exactly they make their money, and also address the effects that pornography has on society. While some of you might find this information disturbing, it's not my goal to upset you, but I want to help get this conversation started so you can continue it. Pornography is, by definition, the depiction of erotic behavior, as in pictures or writing, intended to cause sexual excitement. And while you could argue that individuals throughout history have drawn explicit acts on cave walls or painted them on pottery, as well as carved nude bodies into stone, historians point at the year 1527, towards the end of the Roman Empire, as the defining moment in time when pornography emerged in the form of sexually explicit engravings of gods participating in various acts. Over the centuries, pornography has expanded from stimulating images to written word or what we now know today as erotica, or smut. Some, some people call it smut. Over the next couple of centuries, both copies of engraved images and texts spread throughout Europe, with erotica being read mainly by the wealthy. You know, those who could afford publications during a time when books were expensive. And they could also read when a fair few couldn't. Fast forward to the emergence of photography and film with the camera being pushed to the mainstream. Instead of pornography being carved into stone or painted on a canvas or printed in books, or written as smut, people could now see photos and films of others in the nude or engaged in sex acts. Pornography shops sprouted across the West, and theaters sold tickets to risque films, thanks in part to Alfred Kinsey, whom some refer to as the father of the sexual revolution. A cultural shift began to take place over the next few decades as a result of the sexologist publication, which pertained to exploring the sexual behavior in both the human male and female. Basically, these publications served as collections on Kinsey's research on human sexuality, and the conclusions of these studies were widely accepted because science was generally regarded as a prestigious endeavor. But the reality of Kinsey's research was anything but prestigious. Y'all, I'm just gonna put it plainly, this dude was a pervert with a PhD, who oversaw sexual experiments on children, among other practices funded largely by... Any guesses? the Rockefeller Foundation. As America's attitude towards sex began to shift, adult magazine publications gained popularity, most famously Hugh Hefner's Playboy magazine, which made its debut in the 1950s, featuring what they deemed artistic nudity. And these publications funneled their newfound success into the film industry. But this industry has never been solely about making a dollar off of consenting adults engaging in sex. In the 1970s, Brooke Shields was photographed nude in a bathtub by photographer Gary Gross for the Playboy publication Sugar and Spice. She was 10 years old. In the 1980s, 18-year-old Tracy Lords made headlines when authorities discovered she'd appeared in pornographic movies while she was underage. Between the ages of 15 and 18, Tracy Lords had been in 77 sex films and posed nude for publications like Penthouse Magazine. Both of these are cases that we know about because the individuals involved went on to become famous models and actresses. But what about the young men and women who were exploited by this industry and their stories were never told? The widespread adoption of the VCR allowed individuals to consume pornographic films within the privacy of their own home. The trend continued with the popularity of computers and internet access, with an endless array of photos, films, and even real-time virtual interaction at the user's fingertips. Now, it's estimated that 30% of all data transferred across the internet is porn. About every 40 minutes, a new film is made, and for every second that passes, that accounts for 30,000 people in the United States who are consuming pornography, and one-third of those people are women. 
Porn is now deeply ingrained into our culture, funneled through channels like marketing and advertising. I mean, when you have popular pornography websites taking up billboard space in New York City, viral news outlets like BuzzFeed normalizing porn usage, and social media outlets saturated with pornographic content, I guess it's no surprise that the average age a child is first exposed to pornography is age 11. Pornography is the new sex education, serving as a vehicle for informing a generation about sex. So is this all by chance or by design? Pornhub, which is the most popular website to view free pornography, averages about 64 million visitors per day. And on their website, they even have a sex education portal, which is a little disturbing to me, at least, because if you go to the front page of the world's most popular porn site, it's littered with titles involving incest, violence, abuse, infidelity, and barely legal women. So who exactly is behind this industry? How are they making their money when the most easily accessible pornography is free? Or wait, is it actually free? If something is free, are you really, are you really the customer or are you the product? It's been reported that globally, porn is estimated to be a $97 billion industry, with about $12 billion of that revenue coming from the US. The majority of films in the U.S. are shot and produced in what's known as the Second Hollywood, or the San Fernando Valley. Traditionally, the movies that were produced by film studios out there were sold as a tape or a DVD in a movie store, or individuals would pay to view on their televisions or computer screens. But now, the world's most popular porn website that functions as a portal and also a database, well, the majority of the content there is free. So how is the porn industry still booming? Of course, there are subscription-based websites still around for very specific types of porn, but it's hard to compete with free. The porn monopoly known as MindGeek, which is the overarching entity over Pornhub, offers up ad space for niche sites, collecting a percentage for each customer who signs up. And while their original platform began by offering pirated content and getting traffic and money from those sweet, sweet online impressions, now MindGeek is glad to buy your production company's films and offer you a percentage of the ad revenue. So who are the individuals behind this industry that is growing more brutal and extreme as days pass? The industry is a private one, and for that reason, it's difficult to assess how large it actually is. Warning, warning, this is the part of the video where a few of you are going to get angry with me because I find it disingenuous to omit the obvious. Much like traditional Hollywood, there is a disproportionate amount of Jewish control in the pornography industry. Now, does that mean that it's entirely under Jewish control? Does that mean that all Jewish people support the pornography industry? Does that mean that the pornography industry only employs Jewish people? No, no. And of course not. A Jewish publication, the Jewish Quarterly, was actually the official source of this claim. In an article titled Triple X Nix, Nathan Abrams goes on to describe the Jewish role in erotic publications, film production, and even acting, noting their disproportionate role in this industry and saying, Jews have helped to transform a fringe subculture into what has become a primary constituent of Americana. And then adds that the majority entered the porn industry just to make a buck. Also mentioned in the article is a Jewish pornographer known as the Walt Disney of pornography, Ruben Sturman, who was said to have controlled the majority of the pornography industry in the 1970s, but he remained in the shadow, doing business out of the public eye. However, things took a turn for Sturman later in life and he ended up dying in prison in 1997. Pornographer and publisher of Screw Magazine, Al Goldstein, also gets an honorable mention in the article with his quote, The only reason that Jews are in pornography is that we think that Christ sucks. Catholicism sucks. We don't believe in authoritarianism. End quote. What's been provided here are historical examples of Jewish people in the porn industry. There is an extensive list, but personally, I'd like to move away from highlighting the individuals who claim to be Jews and then do these things and instead pose this question. Is monetary profit the only goal? To attempt to answer this question, we've got to look at the effects of pornography on society. First, let's take a look at the effects on children. 
Like I said before, the average child is exposed to pornography at age 11. Viewing of pornography now serves as sex education. So let's consider those two bullet points and what they mean. If a child has been exposed to pornography at that young of an age, that means that there is a very slim chance that they've had the opportunity to establish a foundation of what it means to have a healthy relationship before viewing these videos that involve group sex, infidelity, and violence towards women. And that's important to note because these experiences shape a child's views on relationships their expectations of what's normal and what's not, and how they see themselves, which carries on into adulthood. If you're an adult who consumes pornography on a frequent or regular basis, according to numerous studies, there's a high probability that your perception of reality is warped, and your sexual preferences are being affected by what's presented to you on a screen. Now, most of these studies deal with male pornography use, and how the instant gratification of pornography usage results in less incentive to find a mate. You know, why would you get up off your couch and leave your house and put pants on and things like that if you can just satisfy whatever sexual desires you might have with a click of a button? But studies show if you actually do leave your house and if you actually do go out and meet someone, yet continue high porn usage, there's a correlation between the usage of pornography and the inability to be aroused by anything besides images on a screen. There are also numerous reports of men being dissatisfied with their relationships because their partner, their woman, doesn't live up to the porn girl fantasy. What I'm trying to say here is that there's a direct link between porn usage and loneliness and even depression. In normalization of these extreme behaviors through various porn propaganda outlets doesn't just affect men. It also affects women, both in the way young girls view themselves and how they're treated by these men who view this pornography on a regular basis. Pornography trends have leaned towards more depraved and violent behaviors towards women. The brutal nature of these videos has increased over the years. And you gotta ask yourself, if you're a consumer of this product, what effect is it leaving on you? Are you unscathed? Or can you really be honest with yourself and ask yourself, what is it doing to me in my perception of reality? Furthermore, adult relationships in which one or more parties consume pornography on a regular basis lead to less and less sex over time meaning less opportunities to produce offspring. Pair up this piece of information with the fact that men who masturbate on a regular basis have lower testosterone levels than those who do not. Studies have shown that women are drawn to men with healthy levels of testosterone because that means they'll have a better chance of having healthy offspring. That's kind of unsettling to consider because we're living in a society where porn use is widespread with diet and other environmental factors that ultimately influence hormones and fertility. When I look at these effects, I would say that if there is an agenda, it's one part depopulation, one part destruction of the traditional family by moral subversion, one part sabotage of the individual through means of addiction and detachment from reality, and perhaps one part blackmail, because nothing you do online is truly private. Searches are being tracked by popular search engines, and these porn portals collect data on you like Facebook does. All of that information is being saved by someone, somewhere. I'll also throw in this nugget of information. Porn fuels the demand for sex trafficking, which is an industry that individuals obviously profit from as well. I know that was all doom and gloom and dark clouds and gray skies, but fear not, the pornography problem is an easy fix. I know that throughout this video I place blame on the porn industry and pornography as a product, but the truth is, without a consumer, there is no market. Without demand, there would be no supply. Therefore, the solution is you. You can decide to rise above the normalization of objectification and abuse. You can decide to invest your time in yourself, in self-betterment, and in making the world a better place, and fostering loving and meaningful relationships, instead of spending your time on choosing what to watch next. What do you have to lose from doing so? Hope you enjoyed the video. I look forward to your comments. Thank you so much for subscribing and supporting my channel on Patreon.